Welcome to Bold Conscious Connections. My name is Raja Panjvani and I'm a certified leadership coach. And I'm Trisha Ramos, a certified high performance coach. Together, we help business leaders redefine success on their terms to create more space and energy so that they live impactful lives. Everyone wants to be seen, heard and understood. So at a deeper level, we know that the collective consciousness is important to raise in this world. And leaders who are influencers can make that difference. We in our coaching programs teach people how to focus on the interconnectedness, heart-centeredness and growth from within. And this is what this podcast will be about. So stay tuned and subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. Talk to you very soon. You know, they say nothing teaches you wisdom better than experience. Our conversation with Caroline Malloy, who's just 24 years old, is evidence of the fact that someone with experience of the kind that she's been through is so packed with wisdom at her young age. She is a South Carolina native that has done everything from modeling for Italian Vogue online to starring in national commercials, working in films alongside major names, publicly speaking for FCA, running a blog about her battle with Lyme disease while fighting it in stage four. She's lived all over the country and is currently getting back into modeling and acting after years off because of her illness while currently working in nutrition as a certified health coach. She's also a writer, an advocate for anti-bullying, anti-human trafficking, and special needs student rights. She's also working on a suicide prevention film, or a suicide awareness film, I should say, and that she talks about in our episode. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Carolyn Malloy. Speaking with Carolyn Malloy, who I happened to meet just... Uh, a few, a couple of months ago, I would say, uh, by chance. And, you know, I was so taken by you and your, and your aura and your persona that I felt so compelled. Uh, and then you, you told me your story, which we'll touch on uh, today um, as much as you'd like to share. And I was like, wow, this, you know, this lady at a, at a young age is such a dynamo, so vibrant, versatile. You've done so many things in your short life of how old are you 24 i think right 24 yes yeah. so welcome welcome to bold conscious connections thank, and this you. thank you for having me i'm excited so excited great so just to set the context um you know we we talk uh, to to people who are bold and conscious and you know leaders in their own right and you certainly are which is why we why you're here and you know we're so eager to talk with you about where you've been and set the context for our listeners as to why, why they should talk, why they should listen to you other than the fact they listen to our podcast. <laughs> oh gosh. I don't even know where to start. Um, yeah, I'm Caroline. I was born and raised on Hilton head, tiny little Island, but um, I started modeling and acting full time when I was 13. And so that kind of, led me down a, you know, strange adult path in a very adult world as a kid trying to kind of navigate that. Um, and I left home for the first time at 17. So I was only a junior in high school. So I feel like there was a lot of growing up that was demanded of me, but also was a choice that I made. I was never, you know, forced into any of it. Um, and quickly after that, I, you know, I came back, finished school on Hilton Head, went off to college, and then um, decided that wasn't for me, moved to California, and uh, got really, really sick. So I had to um, come back home, move back in with my uh, two younger brothers and my parents, um, where after about a year and a half of severely struggling with my health, I was finally um, properly diagnosed with, um, stage four chronic neurological Lyme disease with a ton of co-infections. Um, and so from 2017 until now, um, my whole life has revolved around, uh, hospitals and doctor's appointments and surgeries and treatment and, uh, very, very different from modeling. <laughs> 
Um, but I'm just now starting to get back into a more normal life. I'm not 100% there, but I'm super close. And I recently graduated school online as a nutritionist. So I'm kind of all over the place. I don't really make sense. I'm all over. <laughs> well, that's, that's life. Um, <laughs> and we make sense of it as we go along. How old were you when you finally were diagnosed? Once I was finally diagnosed, I was 20. Okay. And that was in 2017? I was finally diagnosed in 2018, but I, I got ill in 2017. Yes. It took me about a year and a half to get diagnosed. Uh, Lyme disease is, especially in late stage, is very, very difficult to diagnose, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. so. for, for our listeners who aren't familiar with what you might have been dealing with, um, what would you say are probably the most um, debilitating, you know, things that you encountered that you've had to deal with and really work through. Um, exactly. Because by looking at you, you know, this is going to be, it's a podcast, but we'll also have the video on YouTube. And by looking at you, you look well. Um, no, you would never know. <laughs> right. So educate us a little bit on, on what, what somebody, you know, what you were going through and what are some of the things that you continue to go through? Yeah. So to touch on that part really quickly, um, before I go into, into the more debilitating symptoms, I, I, it's interesting. I found such a struggle through the whole process of, um, being, feeling grateful that I still looked normal and like myself, but also wish, wishing so desperately to, um, for people to understand how bad I felt and how, um, I understood when people said, well, at least you look great um, or you don't look sick. I understood that that was coming from a place of, um, you know, being just unaware of, you know, that being hurtful. Um, also coming from a place of love and care and positivity. Um, but when you are so sick and you look fine and you constantly have doctors telling you that you're crazy, nothing's wrong and you look fine. Um, it is really hard to walk around looking normal. I almost at times wished I, you know, didn't have my hair or, to, and that sounds so um, ignorant to say, because I don't know what that's like. Um, but there were so many times where I wished there was something physically that like would explain what was going on, which I did get to a point where that happened because I did have a pick line placed in my arm, which, you know, when you walk around with an IV in your arm, it's uh mm -hmm very obvious that something's wrong. But um, some of my more debilitating symptoms that I dealt with, so Lyme disease is very unique. Uh, there are no two cases alike. So um, it also depends on what stage you're in of what someone will experience. But for me, um, I think the most difficult were um, I had arm tremors every day for 13 hours a day for three months. So my arm would just uncontrollably shake and would flail for 13 hours straight, whether I was awake or asleep. Um, and that, of course, was one of the first times that I like really encountered being stared at in public in a really, you know, uh, strange way. Um, I also had a lot of seizures, so I would seize multiple times a day. Um, I got to a point where I was fainting about seven times a day. So, you know, I was hitting my head all the time. I endured many concussions <laughs> throughout the last couple years. Um, I also had such extreme chronic pain, um, and there was so much pain in going through treatment and your whole body just fighting uh, such a terrible illness. So, I think being introduced and trying to navigate a lot of different medications and uh, being introduced to opioids and trying to figure out like how to manage life when medications like that don't allow you to live. They don't even allow you to feel. So there were so many different mental battles throughout the whole thing. But in the last four years, I've had 17 surgeries. So a lot of time in bed. Um, which will lead to a very extreme mental battle for someone, um, which led me to a very, very dark and suicidal place. Um, but great, like, I'm so grateful my family was 
pretty aware of that without me having to say it and were able to stop that from happening. Um, but you know, I would have blind spells, deaf spells. I threw up every single time I ate, um, for two and a half, three years. Um, there's, so I lost my ability to feel from my waist down for a little while. So temporary paralysis. Um, mm. so, I mean, just so many, so many symptoms. Wow. Wow. Well, thank difficult. you for, um, taking us through that and really, um, helping, helping our listeners understand what you were going through. And, um, you know, when I met you, when I visited Raju a couple, well, I guess it's only a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I met you. Yeah. I would never have imagined that you were going through or had gone through all of that. Um, that's a lot of time that you spent processing all everything and the healing. Where are you with your own healing? It's a great question. Um, such an intuitive question. I, um, you know, I'm really grateful. So prior to getting ill, when I was in high school, I dealt with a, a couple spouts of mental health battles. And um, so I was introduced to therapy when I was 14. And so um, I think for me, I am grateful for that because it wasn't something new for me when going through all this. I was able to quickly you know, be in a conscious enough state to say like, I need to talk to somebody and I need to talk to somebody now, or I'm not going to make it. Um, and so in my physical healing, I'm doing really well. I still go to, um, I'm still in brain therapy. So I had to do a complete retraining of my brain and reactivating systems that, um, had been basically shut off for a long time. Um, and I started that about a year and a half ago. I still go every single morning. Um, so I'm still in that kind of treatment. I don't have to do IV treatment every day anymore, which is nice. And I'm still on a lot of different supplements that, you know, my body just certain vitamins it won't produce or intake, but, um, healing from my most recent surgery, kind of finishing that up. I just hit my one year mark. And so physically I'm doing great mentally. Um, it's always a battle, you know, it's kind of up and down, uh, mm -hmm. just with life in general. So mentally, I feel like I'm in a pretty good place because I'm very aware of how up and down I can be. And um, I'm doing a big deep dive in therapy right now into my childhood and into so many different things that mm -hmm. even through being sick, I may not uh, consciously remember, but at a subconscious level, my body is definitely experiencing. So mm -hmm. um, I think I'm doing pretty good for, for going through the processing stage of everything. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you for being so open. Mm. Oh my gosh. I think it's, I mean, to me, I know it's not every for everybody and it, everybody's not comfortable with that, but I do feel that's part of my human duty to <laughs> just be honest and be really open about life because I think, especially coming from a world of modeling and acting and being around celebrities and, you know, so many different things, your life can look so different from what it actually is. And I, I do think it's like my human civic duty to be really honest about what life can be and how quickly life can turn and change. And, um, you know, how today doesn't mean, you know, today isn't necessarily, um, you know, accurate of what tomorrow is going to be or of what yesterday was. And, um, I just, feel like being open and sharing everything, which may be a fault. I don't know, but sharing everything I feel is part of my duty to humanity. <laughs> well, you know, the, the idea that you feel comfortable, uncomfortably comfortable, maybe comfortably uncomfortable, um, to be able to, even if you impact one person uh, that may want to hear something, that's, that's great. Um, I, yeah. I think you... Clearly, uh, you know, here I was sitting in that sitting in that first time I was sitting in that conference room where you were waiting for somebody to, to arrive. It was clear that there was an energy you had that, you know, you were you were you were just not necessarily just positive or negative. You were just real. And it was so easy that you started to talk about this. And I think what 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 you just mentioned earlier, too, is that, you know, you said one of the surgeries or before the surgeries, you, you were completely had no sense of waist down uh, for a while. Uh, 
that 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 took me for for a while like wow and then here she is looks amazing and vibrant and active so clearly you're doing something and i think you're you're uh your emotional and mental and other healing besides the physical is clearly a priority and and you're meant to inspire i suppose that's what you yeah, that's very kind of you thank you yeah i think our well and just so that I don't mislead anybody, but my temporary paralysis was just like a symptom. I didn't have to have surgery to fix that or anything like that, just oh, so okay. I don't mislead anybody. But it would just kind of come in and out where either from the shoulders down or the waist down, it would just all of a sudden I would mm -hmm. like my legs would turn in and I just couldn't, you know, feel, but there was no like surgery to fix that. Um, but yeah, I think we live in a society where there's like this really um, common thing to almost have toxic positivity to where it's like, um, mm. you know, if you're not going 24 seven, you're not hustling 24 seven, and you're not like the most positive human being 24 seven, you're wrong, and you're bad, and you're, you know, a negative person. And I just think there's a real problem to that. Because I, I think it's, you know, we're trying to get into this place where mental health and checking in with ourselves is normal and um, asking people how they're really doing is n normal and sincere and genuine. But when you go from not talking about mental health at all to pushing into, well, you need to be moving at, you know, your fastest speed every second of the day, or you're failing or you're falling behind, mm. I think is a very dangerous spot to put people in because um, that's not checking in with yourself. That's not actually sitting down and, you know, figuring out how you're doing and how you're feeling. And, um, I spent the better half of last year, just not probably making the amount of money that I needed to be making because I wasn't working as much as I needed to be. But I knew that if I didn't take the time to like be in really intensive therapy multiple times a week for sometimes two, three hour long sessions a, a time and really heal myself. I wasn't going to be productive for anybody else because it was, I was going to crash and burn at some point. And so I think we're kind of in that we need to get to the more real state where it's like, things are good. Things are bad. You know, it doesn't mean we're negative or positive. We're just like here and this is life and it ebbs and flows and we need to get a little more comfortable in that ebb and flow. No, I'm glad you brought that up. Tell us about the project that you're working on to help raise mental health awareness. Yeah, so I'm super excited. Um, I just, well, we're very close to finishing, but I just wrote and um, executive produced my first film called 622, which I'm also um, starring in alongside my co-writer and co-producer. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's called 622. It's a suicide awareness film. Um, it's something that we both felt the market was lacking. There's not really a lot out there about actual suicide. It's usually used, unfortunately, as a way to just kill off a character. Um, the actual suicide itself isn't usually dealt with, processed, or addressed. Um, and it's such a big component of mental health because, um, you know, even if you don't necessarily have a suicide attempt or you haven't lost somebody to suicide, um, I know for me, when I get deep in my depression, suicidal ideations rise um, and I can never figure out why <laughs> that that's where my brain goes. Some people's brains don't go there, but mine does. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited and honored to A, be able to be sitting here alive and um, to have made it through those suicidal ideations and, and you know, planning mm -hmm. of attempts and things like that, to be able to share with people how, um, how like worth life, you know, life is so worth it and to spread the message of hope and, but to also say like, it's okay if you're there and it's okay if you've been there, like there's no shame or guilt or judgment in that. It's a real thing that a lot of people deal with. And um, it's also a real thing that a lot of people deal with, but choose not to deal with. And so it can get even worse and darker because they're not dealing with it. And I think sometimes that is how someone can get to the actual doing of it. And, um, you know, I know that not everybody has an intuitive family that is, you know, aware of the person's mental 
state or is around enough to observe the person. Um, I know not everybody has that privilege of, you know, my parents watching me be ill. So they saw how mm. bad every day was. Um, but I, um, I just think it's so prevalent and I just think it's rising. You know, I believe the most recent s- statistic I'll have to like look up and double check, but it's gone up a hundred percent in women, mm. um, in the last two years. I'll have to double check on that, but I'm almost certain I'm like 99.9% positive. That's the right number. Mm. Um, and I think social media plays such a big role into that. And even last year, I had to take a huge step back from social media because um, though there are opportunities to be an influencer and to make money on social media and to do all these things when you're in my line of work, um, it didn't feel authentic or genuine to where my mental state was. And I have a really big issue with um, the misleadingness of social media and uh I'm still currently trying to figure out how to be okay with having a highlight reel, um, but also, you know, not making it seem like that is my everyday life and that everything's great and perfect. And, um, and, but also like trying to accept that, you know, if I do post a happy moment, I'm not, you know, taking away from somebody else's sad moment, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out still. Um, But I just think we, we as a society post the best moments and that it can be dangerous if we're not all aware that it is that person's best moment. And so I actually have a separate Instagram account um, that I created when I started my blog, Sweet Kara Lyme, and about my Lyme disease battle. And it was all my worst moments. And um, especially when, you know, coming from a world of modeling and acting where everything is uh, so perfect. <laughs> um, it was important for me to show that things were really bad and that it wasn't, you know, so perfect. And so this film, I think really, you know, kind of touches that, that she, you know, she looks fine. Um, her, her family has no idea she's suicidal. She doesn't share that she's suicidal. Um, and you know, it comes, comes as a shock to everyone because she hasn't verbalized it. And I think, you know, we need to understand too, that people who are suicidal or who are in really deep mental health battles, um, are not necessarily loners. They're not necessarily only people that don't have any friends. They're not necessarily someone who wears all black and sits in the corner. They're not like they're, we're normal people walking around who can be, you know, living a completely incredible life. And, be extremely suicidal. There's no, you know, it doesn't discriminate. So um, Mm -hmm. I think we need to really break that stigma too of like, oh, well, they, you know, had nothing going on in their life. So they killed themselves. Like, that's just not real. (laughs) So yeah, I'm super honored and excited to be bringing this film to life. Um, Yeah. Wow. Well, that's such insight and wisdom that you bring bring at this point given all your experiences of course so are you able are you at liberty to talk as to what led to well not led to but what is 6.22 what does that mean or 622 um i know you play charlie is is your role yes charlie is my character Mm -hmm. um and 622 i'm gonna have to double check with my co-writer on if i can share this or not yet but i'm pretty sure i can but 622 is um is the time of day that she leaves leaves the world so Hmm. the last time she looks at her phone is 622 and it's a short film it Uh, is it's a short film yes so it'll be a festival submission film um Hmm. and um yeah i'm super excited should be hopefully out uh by march so how did the idea come to you you know i'm always curious in in the uh creative process you know what it is Since creativity is, it's so personal, right? Like it's something that I believe chose us, whatever that is that we are bringing forth. How did this project come about? Um, If you can, if you can just recall for us what, what it was like to, I guess, awaken to it. Yeah. I I love that so much because, um, so one of my closest friends who, wrote this with me and produced it with me and also stars in it playing Charlie's boyfriend river. Um, his name's Derek Fallon. 
and he and I were writing a script um, together. We had just done a music video together back in the spring and we were writing a script and um, I was going through some, some personal struggles at the time this past summer. And we were talking about mental health came up somehow and he kind of just stopped our writing session. Um, I was sitting in a Starbucks parking lot in my car typing. <laughs> um, and because I was like just in this terrible mental state, and I didn't even want to go inside and be around people. I was like being, you know, I was really isolating myself. And um, he, because it's such a small island and I was born in Hilton Head Hospital. So, you know, when you've been around for 24 years and your parents have been around, you know, even longer than that, you just know everybody. <laughs> so I resorted to my car for writing sessions. And um, he said, why don't we write a film about suicide and about mental health? And I kind of, you know, my eyes got really big. And I, I think I even got teary and was like, I said yes immediately, but there was something so deep in me that was like, I don't know if I can do that. Um, and um, he has struggled with very similar things and he's a lot more removed from his, um, his battles than I am. And so for me, it was definitely, there was a fear there. Um, but I also knew, and I have known from a very young age that I am called to speak and to share. And I don't know what that means, you know, whether that's just speaking here on a podcast or that's speaking to one person in a coffee shop or speaking to a thousand people at a conference. Like, I don't know what that looks like, but I know that that is a calling I feel. And um, I've never shied away from sharing about my mental health. You know, I share about it on social media a lot. And so there was something in me that was saying no, but I immediately said yes. And we changed the script that day, like set the other one aside, started working on this script and um, going through the process of writing the script was, um, was so amazing because we both could pull from our own experiences, but also our creative side and both being actors. And there was, there was, it was so much fun writing the film, but actually filming it last week, um, filming a suicide scene, um, there was something in me that was totally healed by doing that. And I was so afraid of it. Um, and I wasn't afraid of it leading up to it. I had no fear in my, um, I mean, I don't mean that in a, you know, like conceited way. I just, I didn't have a fear of filming that. I didn't have any fear of like my acting ability in that scene or anything. It didn't really scare me. But then when we got, to the scene, there was something in me that was like, no, 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 no. Like, you can't do this. You don't, you're not capable. You can't do this. Like, you need to step back. Like, what do I do? And um, I uh, just pulled someone from the crew that um, I grew up with and is one of my best friends and um, pulled her into my bathroom and I was sitting on the floor and I was just kind of rocking back and forth. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think I can do this. Like, I don't think I can do this. Mm -hmm. And um, she really like sat with me and talked through my own experience and then talked through um, Charlie, my character's experience, because it's also it can be dangerous to, to put yourself into that. You know, you don't want to take home the character. So it was very important mm -hmm. that I sat in Charlie's experience and not my own, but yet pulled from my own because as actors, like whatever role you play, there is a tiny bit of you in there. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you don't play it well. <laughs> and um and there was something when I finished um, a very, very emotional scene that like, I was like whole and healed. Like there was something in Charlie that healed me. Um, and I think there's so much power to going to your darkest, um, most painful moments and also understanding how much of a reality that could have been and what that could have done to the people around me and, um, and, and what I wouldn't have gotten to experience. And, but I also say that with caution because I don't recommend going to your darkest um, places if you are not emotionally ready or emotionally mature or emotionally um, 
in a place where, you know, I knew that I could call my therapist as soon as it was over and tell her either like, I'm okay, or I'm not okay. And thankfully, I was able to say like, I'm great, like something in me just, you know, healed up and became whole. But I do just want to say that with caution, I don't recommend anyone going to their darkest place if they don't have nearby help or the emotional um, intelligence or, you know, qualities to be able to do that because it, it can be extremely dangerous. And so I don't, I don't necessarily recommend that without the help. But I, I think you're, you're, you know, the help, the support, um, you certainly have mentioned multiple times the amount of support that you and your parents have lined up around you. Yes. And um, I love what you just shared because that is where the healing is, right? The, the, the simple truth is that we all go around day to day trying to avoid feeling the things we don't want to feel. And Raju and I talk about this all the time. Whatever you can't feel, you're not going to heal. Right. Whatever you're not willing to feel, you're just, it's never gonna, it's never going to resolve itself. Um, and how beautiful that you are able to have, <clears throat> you know, that moment of, I want to say uh, the word release just came to me. That oh, moment of a, release. a release of of really what is what is a, a reawakening? It's really you're reawakening to someone who you've never been, right? And that's a release of who you have, who you had been. Yeah. Uh, and what you just shared, what I gathered there was like really a reawakening, like a rebirth. Um, and how beautiful that you got to experience it within your own, like what you are co-creating. Right. And also being, you know, aware and awake enough to realize it's happening because sometimes we're not, you know, when you are emotionally shut off and shut down and not in tune, um, something like that may happen or, you know, you may have the opportunity to have that moment, but if you're not, um, in tune enough or aware, uh, you're not allowing yourself to have that. And I think because I had stripped Caroline away and dove into Charlie, but you know, there are parts of Caroline in Charlie. Um, I think I was able to really be open to whatever the, you know, all possibilities and whatever was going to happen. And, and, and that happens in my creative process in acting always, which is, you know, I'm open to whatever the character brings out in me and whatever it, you know, that person is asking of me in the moment and willing to ebb and flow with that. But I think, um, I think there's just something that's so beautiful about, you know, being able to, to look at that and say like, that's not me in my most authentic state. Like mm. that isn't my most authentic person, but that happened to me and I'm aware of that. And it's a part of my story, but it's not who I am. And, um, I'm so grateful for that chapter in my life, but that chapter is closed <laughs> like that. Yes. Is not, wow, you know, that amazing. is not, it is a huge part of my story and a huge part of why I can sit here today and say the things I can say and be awake enough, but it is not who I am. And it is not, um, you know, a determining factor in the rest of my life and every decision I make. Yes. Thank you. Thank mm. you for sharing that with us. It's so powerful. Thank you more, please, Raju. And I like to say thank you more, please, for, for those types of realizations. One more thing, and then I'm going to um, hand it over to Raju. I'm sure he's like dying to jump in. You said <laughs> something that I just want to highlight. Yeah. And you said you stripped away Carolyn and you really, you know, it was you made it be about Charlie. And very often in our work that Raju and I do with our clients, what we recognize is there's so much power in expanding your perspective beyond just you in um, solving the problems are, are getting the answer or getting better, you know, that it really requires opening up your perspective 
in a much broader manner so that you can see that um, there is so much more to you than your illness or your problems or your past history. Um, and I think, you know, for our listeners listening, that is really one of the keys for a, a, a breakthrough. Like if, if you're listening to this and you're, you're wondering, you know, when are you going to, when is that breakthrough going to happen? When are you going to feel better? When is it going to shift? Um, that is one of the things that you can do is to begin to expand your focus beyond just you and your stories and yourself. Because when you're able to do that, then you can see the fullness of life, the fullness of possibilities, that there's infinite potential out there and that your life is ever changing moment to moment. There's yeah. opportunity. And I think, I think, you know, one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves, um, specifically when we haven't, you know, and I, I don't say it in a way that, you know, everybody needs to go to therapy. I mean, I, I personally am a huge advocate for it and think everyone can benefit from it, but I know it's not for everybody. So I don't mean that. And, you know, you may find it in a different avenue, um, or a different medium of, you know, that area, but one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that didn't affect me. It didn't affect me. And if it didn't affect you, it just means you've shut off the idea of what feelings you have from that. Um, and especially if you can't remember a trauma, um, like if you know something big happened in your life, but you're like, Oh, I, you know, I was, I don't remember like what that was like. Um, there's something in you that's not awake and that's not conscious. Um, but you know, our brains at a subconscious level are still processing that and are still dealing with that. And um, I think for me, um, I had to really also go through a shift of mindset because for me, I'm a very um, strong Christian and that is, you know, that is my identity. That is like really where I lay my identity and grow from. And so I think for me, there were a lot of times where I had to look back and say, well, because for a long time I had the mindset of like, why me? What did I, I'm a good person. What did I do to deserve this? Like this sucks. I hate this. And, um, and I was like very upset with God for a long time when I was sick. Cause I was like, I don't understand any of what you're doing and I'm not happy about it. And, um, and so I had to go through, you know, bringing myself back to the truth, which for me is the Bible and, and God, and Jesus never promised a life of no suffering. Um, he actually promised the exact opposite. And so I think having to change my mindset into what an honor to suffer um, and to suffer well. And But how can I suffer well? And how can I turn this suffering into um, something so much greater and where my suffering isn't my identity? but it's a part of my story and how can I allow myself to be moldable right now and really mold into the person that I am supposed to be as opposed to um, like living in this immediate suffering. And, um, and I, I, a lot of times had to picture, like I really had to go to a picture and think in my head of Jesus on the cross and like how painful that was. And, um, and, and, kind of bring myself back into reality of like, you know, I wasn't promised anything better than this. And if this is what my life is, how can I make this good? And how can I see the good in this? And I don't mean that in that that was a positive, happy time in my life. I just had to kind of find um, like what can be done through this. And for me, that was starting an Instagram account where I shared all the bad that was that I was going through and a lot of other people were able to connect and say oh my gosh thank you like I'm not alone and I didn't know other people were feeling like this or you know I didn't know you could look like this and have a stage four illness or I didn't know you know and so for me it was it was figuring out well what is the purpose in this pain um, because I do believe there is purpose in all pain um mm -hmm. And I don't believe you have to suffer in silence. I mean, that's why we, that's why we are naturally born to have community and want, you know, even if you're an introvert, I do believe you want to be around people to some degree, because I think our, us and our most 
most authentic state craves that. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have nothing to say. I'm just dumbfounded. That's all I can say. <laughs> wow. It is. I know it is it's a lot. lot. My story can be a lot, but. No, that's all right. It's, it's our, it's a story. I mean, you know, two people or multiple people can go through the same event as Trisha and I talk about this. Events are neutral. It's what yeah. meaning you choose to give it. So, Absolutely. you know, and everybody's people, experience in the same event can be so different. So different. So different. Um, so you're highlighting that that and that you not only are a person of faith, but you know the, the people, the kind of clients we work with. We want those that are more awake uh, to the idea that everything is possible in the moment, and the fact that when you move with without feeling being stuck, but you just move, like you at, sitting at that Starbucks said yes, even though there was some resistance in saying I'm not doing this, but you said yes anyway. It was that moment of tr truth for you to move and step into that, step into that darkness with some faith because right. it was supposed to take you through all that you went through. And then even in the role of Charlie, you're, you're almost resisted not doing that scene, but you did it anyway. So I think part of it is just trusting that, you know, somewhere you're protected. It's okay. And your life is perhaps meant to teach other people something. So it's really amazing. Uh, Amazing what you've shared in insights. Thank so. you. I think it's so relieving to um, step back and and um, kind of disengage from the narrative that you know we are these um, incredibly powerful beings because we are. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's really um, powerful in itself to step back and say like I'm not actually in control of all of this and that is great because the pressure is no longer on me yep. and this isn't all you know Caroline needing to figure all of this out um, and I think if we can step back and realize we we're powerful but we're not that powerful to where we are in control of every circumstance and outcome and you know mm -hmm. we need to figure everything out um, I think if you can surrender to yourself and then surrender to your, um, you know, your higher power for me, if I can surrender to God, like I can really gain some perspective because when you're too close to something, you have no perspective and that's not a fault. It's just the truth. We've all been there. Like it's not right, wrong, bad, or good. It's just the truth. I mean, when you're too close, you can't see straight and that's, that's, we all go through that. And so I think when you can really step back and, and take the pressure off of having to figure it all out and to have to be the one making all the executive decisions, then there is so much weight taken off of your shoulders because, and I love the quote, like, like you said, when I said yes to Charlie, but there was some resistance. I love the quote, um, say yes often, but say no enough to make your yeses count. And that was one of those things that it was just an immediate yes. And the yes counted. Mm. Beautiful. So, yeah. so you know, in our world, mine well, and Roger. Also, I'm right. so sorry to interrupt you. There's construction all of a sudden going on outside. So if you hear that, I'm really sorry. We don't hear it. Okay. Don't hear it. Um, and, you know, we, we, uh, we don't believe that time is linear and that we actually are in quantum time. So if, if we were to just um, allow ourselves to play for a minute, let's say that it's 10 years from now and you are, that would make you 34. Yes. Oh gosh. Yes. <laughs> You're now 34 and it's 10 years from now. What would you say to your 24 year old self? Oh, I love this. I recently wrote a letter to my seven-year-old self because that's how old I was when I was bit by a tick and my Lyme disease lay dormant for, I think that's 12 or 13 years. So I wrote a letter to her um, because I saw so much innocence in her eyes and I'm like, oh, you have no idea what just happened to you. And, um, and you won't know for so long. And um, gosh, I would just come back to this 24-year-old version and just you know, I don't really allow my, I, I really struggle with um, allowing myself to feel like I've done enough 
or proud or, um, you know, a, not accomplished, that's not the right word, but, you know, feeling like anything I've done is worth anything at all. And I, I, I can see that my older self would come back and say, like, can you take a second and just appreciate like where you've been and where you've come and have some compassion for, um, you know, the trauma you went through, but what you turned that into and, and, and the fact that you even want to face that trauma and take it to someone else and say, you know, Hey, there's so much more out there for your life. Um, and so I, I, I am really working on trying to go ahead and get in that headspace, but I can totally see my older self being like, Hey, can you just take a second and like, take it? Well, you're her now. Yeah. You're her now. So what is she saying to, you, to your 24 year old self? Just to be proud of how far you've come, of how far I've come. And, and, and to take a second and realize how incredible that is for my story and for myself and not for anybody else. And maybe it'll help somebody else, but for me and, um, and, you know, to just be okay with no matter what happens that I, I got to grow from this. So, you know, no matter whether anybody ever sees it or it fails or it, or, you know, nothing works out with, you know, the film or whatever, like I got to grow through that and that's enough. And you need, you know, I need to like take a second and just appreciate that in itself. And so now if my current self could just like really soak that in and do something about it, then we'll, well be all reason good. for the question. Yeah. <laughs> it's already happening, it's already happening, you know, it's already there. And I think that um, often we're, we look outside of ourselves for uh, validation or reinforcement when really the person we're seeking approval from is us. Right. It's within. So it's so true. I check in with myself all the time when I, I mean, I've really cut back from my posting on social media, but producing this film, I've had to get a little bit more active again. And I, not when posting for the film, but when posting for myself, I really have to check in on like, am I posting this because like, I love this moment or I love this, or am I posting this for some form of validation from someone? And if so, who am I seeking the validation from? Why? And then like, let's cut that back for a second and go back into like, okay, something's wrong up here. If we, Caroline, are seeking validation for this or a proving of something that I don't owe anybody. <laughs> so mm. I, I think with social media, we really fall into the trap of needing that validation even more from outside sources. And I think that's really dangerous for young, growing, developing brains and young teens. And it's very, I mean, it's dangerous as an adult, but it's, you know, especially dangerous for our young, young generation. Um, whose brains are not fully developed yet and who are not fully awake yet. And, um, and no matter, you know, whether you're 80 or you're eight, you know, not fully awake, whatever state you're in. But um, I think we have to really try to get to a conscious state of where, like, what is the intention behind this? What am I seeking? Why am I not enough? Why is, why is it not enough for just me to be okay with this? And, um, and if so, like digging into that, like go start writing to yourself, go turn on your favorite song, go turn on a song from a time that, um, you know, that will spark some nostalgia, go watch a movie that you love, go watch a movie that was from your childhood. And I think there's so much to be said for, and I wouldn't have said this over a year ago, but there's so much to be said for how in the Bible, it does say to have childlike faith. And I think we can turn that into every area of life. There's so much to be said for returning to your childlike state where you have no ability to care about what everybody else is thinking. And you are running around so free and un um, tampered with to whatever mm -hmm. age that comes from. I know that, you know, trauma starts for some people immediately when they're born or for others, not till later on. So I don't mean that in a way of, you know, not being aware of everyone's different circumstances, but getting back to that place where that, that person hasn't quite, you know, you, you haven't grown up to figure out the world yet and you haven't grown up to figure out how, how dangerous it can be, not necessarily always in a physical way. 
And when you can return there, I mean, there's just so much freedom in yourself, allowing yourself to get to your true, most authentic state. And a lot of times that is learning how to care, but not care about everything else. Like learning how to really care for yourself and that self-care is a lot more than a face mask. And, Mm. you know, there's so much out there um, that we are just not awake and open to and our eyes are closed Um, And we're just walking through life without seeing any of it. And um, I just think that we are really lacking opportunity to grow. Uh, Yet we all claim that we want to grow and be the best version of ourselves, but we don't really want to open up to that possibility because it's so scary. Um, But man, if you can just get there, there's so much freedom and so much joy. Well, thank you for all those reminders and all the different ways that somebody can access that inner child and really go read your favorite children's book. I babysit all the time and I'm reading these kids their, you know, books before bedtime. And some of them are the books I read as a kid. And I'm like, gosh, this is a great story. I need to go buy this book. This makes me happy. I love this story. No more monkeys jumping on the bed. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Raju and I always talk about, um, the importance for that curiosity, that childlike yeah. curiosity. And, you know, um, one of the most exciting moments we shared together is when we realize how much we don't know. Like when we actually wake up and I we're like, I cannot, that. and that's actually a point of celebration yeah. for us. But, the, you know, when we don't know is something to celebrate because then it says we're still learning and we're still tapping into um possibilities and yes i was literally right when you said that i was thinking okay i need to say i need to you know go ahead and say this too because just in the last six months i have really become okay with not knowing and not feeling like i have to put on you know imposter syndrome and then go google it in the back um i am because I've never written a film before. I've never produced a film before. I've only ever been in front of the camera. And that's a whole new world for me. And a lot of the people who worked on this film, they've been behind the camera before. And there was a lot I didn't know and still don't know. And I loved getting to a place where asking questions and saying, gosh, I don't know, um, didn't make me feel less than weak or stupid. It allowed me to learn and grow because when you let it make you feel stupid and less than and weak and dumb and all the things, um, you can't learn, you can't learn. And then you're stuck with limited knowledge. And how boring is that? I mean, that is like, even being a nutritionist, sometimes, you know, people, clients will ask me a question and I had to get comfortable saying, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to go look at that or reach out to a colleague and get back to you. And at first I felt so ashamed by that. I was like, gosh, I should know, you know, I should know the answer to this, but we don't know what we don't know. And that's okay. (laughs) And that is a celebration. It's a great moment to get there. It really is. Because in that moment, your receptors are open. Right. Finally. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Listen, we could talk to you forever. Uh, <laughs> I know. Maybe you come back again for another yes. after your movie's released. I'd be honored. I would love so that. we we don't take anything for granted. Every single moment. I'm so glad I met you just like at Starbucks, Me not too. not Starbucks, yeah. but the other the yeah. place. Um, and the and the fact that you said something is is how it all began, right? So here I you know. are. So uh, we don't take any of these moments for granted because we just don't know everything, as we just said. So uh, truly uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, and in that vein of not not missing any opportunity to learn every single... I mean, we've learned a lot just now so much in the past hour. Uh, in that vein, what might you have discovered in this hour that we've spent together about yourself? What have I discovered? Yeah. I actually found it a lot easier to talk to myself from my older version than I thought it was going to be. I didn't think I could do that. So that was a big discovery. I loved that. (laughs) You get to practice that more and more. I, you know, that was one of the, it's, it's such a great tool to build up your confidence because think about it. If you really believe that time is not linear. Right. 
then you must really believe that everything that you want for you, it's already here. Right. right. And that we actually have this concept of linear time only so that we can keep things organized. That's it. <laughs> So if you gave yourself permission to bounce back and forth and know that you're okay, you're good, then you would be able to increase that childlike curiosity, that adventurous, you know, spirit mm -hmm. even yeah. more. It's true. That's going to so, be my task. I'm going to work on it. This is my hey, new which goal. is why we love the idea of future journaling. Future journaling yeah. is about already manifesting something in the future. Because then you're, then you're allowing yourself to move from the present to the future and not letting all the old stuff play in your, in your yeah, psyche, yeah. in your head and, and your I current. I just recently started speaking things out loud That's that so I want. Beautiful. And, yes, because um, your words are powerful. Yeah, believing in the yeah. spoken word and not only just praying about it, but also saying, you know, that that prayer has been answered yeah. and, and, and believing that. And, um, it's very powerful. Well, before we sign up, yeah. go ahead. Check out Dr. Joe Dispenza's work. Yes, um, love him. Yes, love yes, him. because this is what we're talking about is very love. much in line with his work. So same with Dr. Yeah. Caroline Leaf. If you don't know who she is, she's very same path. She's amazing. Highly recommend. Well, check it cool. out. Yeah. Awesome. So before well, we thanks. close, Caroline, well, where? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Um, where can people reach you? you? You know, we talked about that we'll put stuff in the show notes. Uh, yes, yes. But where, while somebody's still listening to this, where can they find you? Um, the easiest way to reach me is definitely on Instagram, which is just Caroline Malloy, which is M-O-L-L-O-Y, even though everyone spells it M-A, even my high school diploma. <laughs> um, but Caroline Malloy is definitely the easiest. I do have a website, which is Caroline-Malloy.com, um, but I would say Instagram's easiest because then I can just give you my personal information, but that's the best way to keep up with everything. The film has its own Instagram, but I'm always posting about it on my own account and all of that. So I would say my account is the easiest to, to follow awesome. along. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you and, um, hope yeah, to see you again. So to have been here. All Thank the you. Back to you. Take Thank care. You. Bye. 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 We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if so, make sure to subscribe, download, and share it with your sphere of influence. You know, we bring a variety of topics to you, and it's like a masterclass for those topics, and it's all free. So take a screenshot, share it on your social media, and add the hashtag Bold Conscious Connections so that we can find you, see you, maybe say hello. And if you want to deep dive into some of the topics that we bring to you, uh, find us at www.livemasterminds.com and get to know us. Take care.